Hi everyone, uh, my name is Edwin and I'm going to talk to you today about a new version of the Idris programming language, Idris 2, which is uh, based on quantitative type theory. I'm going to talk about what that means and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we can use uh, quantities in practice. So Idris is a, a purely functional programming language, kind of in the tradition of Haskell. So if you've seen Haskell, then, then hopefully the syntax that I'm going to show you will be uh, familiar to you. So the distinctive thing about Idris is that it has first class types. So when I say first class types, I mean that uh, types are just like any other thing, like integers or strings, you can assign them to variables, you can pass them to functions, you can return them from functions, you can do all the things that you can do with any other variable. So just to briefly introduce quantitative type theory, the, the key idea that we're going to see throughout the examples I'm going to show you is that every variable is associated with a quantity. So QTT itself is kind of agnostic as to what those quantities can be. So we've made a choice for Idris 2 that every variable has either quantity 0, 1 or omega. 0 meaning it's not used at runtime, so guaranteed erased. 1 meaning that it's used exactly once at runtime. And omega, so just like any other variable in any other language, uh, unrestricted usage at runtime. So a valuable thing about this is it allows us to express erasure, that is, we can say exactly what is used at runtime and what isn't. So that's actually been a long-standing problem in dependently typed programming to know to know exactly what's going to be in your final program. But more excitingly, um, it allows us to express uh, protocols. So we can express linearity in types. Uh, that means that not only can we say precisely what a program is supposed to do, but we can also say precisely when it's allowed to do it. So the first thing I want to show you is uh, an implementation of run length encoding. So run length encoding, it's a system used in like old TV signals and old graphics programs where you say how many of a, of a thing you've got. So it's, it's uh, you know, I have, I have five red pixels followed by six blue pixels and, and so on. So an empty run length encoded list is the encoding, the run length encoding of the, the empty list. Or if I have uh, a number n, a natural number n, and some value x and some run length encoded data more, then run length encoding is a representation of n plus one copies of x. So it's just to guarantee that this, this isn't going to be zero copies of x, um, followed by the rest of the list. I'm not going to show, talk about compression here because it, it gets a little bit tricky, but I'm, I'm going to show you what happens if we try to write the uncompressed function. When we write the uncompressed function, we've got a run length encoded list x's and we want, to, we want to return some list, which is hopefully going to be the initial data. Now, the initial data is x's. So you think, well, surely I could just add a definition and try returning x's directly. So let's, let's try doing that. Try loading that into uh, Idris. It says, well, no, I can't do that because x's is not accessible. Basically, there are zero copies of x's available at runtime. I can take a look at that. If I if I put a hole for the definition, we can see if, if Idris shows us the context of this hole and it says, well, I've got X's, which is a list of this element type, but there's none of it available. And if you think about it, that's a good thing. If I've got some run length encoded data, uh, I want to be able to talk about that data at compile time, but I definitely don't want the initial data at runtime until I've uncompressed it, because otherwise I haven't actually had any. Uh, I, I haven't actually done any good. I haven't compressed it if I've still got the original data around. So if I'm going to write this function, um, I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to actually go through the process of uncompressing it, um, just to keep things um, efficient. Um, what I'm actually going to do is is say I'm using this singleton type here. So singleton type um, says that uh, uh, th th it can only take one value. So the thing I'm going to return is um, the singleton type containing only the, contains only the value x's. Um, a singleton type takes a value, and then that value is in the index of the type. But there's there's no quantity annotation on here. If there's no quantity annotation, the default is that it's unrestricted. So when I've implemented this function, it's guaranteed that the thing that is returned is going to be the initial data, and that's going to be available at runtime. It's guaranteed that it's going to be the same as the data that we're talking about at compile time, even though this X wasn't available. So this function is going to be guaranteed to correctly reconstruct the original data. And I'm not going to write it uh, myself. I'm just going to ask the machine. I don't even, uh, there's a keystroke here I'm pressing for generate definition. So this is what I mean by... Um, I'm going, to re I'm going to lay it out a bit neater than the machine did. Um, uh, so the machine has generated this definition just by following the types, yeah, using using a 
time-driven program synthesis um, to generate the uncompressed list uh, from the original list. So we've had to, we, we, we have had to go through the process of rebuilding it, but the types guarantee that the thing that we've rebuilt is the same as the thing that was there in the first place. So the important thing about this definition, and the thing that is new in Idris 2, is that um, uh, the types tell us that X's is something we have to rebuild at runtime. It's only available to us at compile time. So that's erasure. Um, a more exciting thing we can do, although I mean maybe maybe let um, maybe erasure is, is going to be crucial to all programs in Idris 2. I certainly think it is. But linearity is something that's that's quite exciting because it, it gives us the ability to talk about protocols. So here's an example protocol that um, that uh, I guess um, I guess you'll all be familiar with. Uh, going to uh, an automated teller machine, putting in your bank card, entering your PIN, getting out some cash. So there's some security properties here. We want to make sure that um, you are only going to get the cash when you're in a validated state. So we've got a state machine. We've got the ready state, which is the ATM sitting there waiting for you to put your card in. We can insert the card. We're in the card inserted state. We only get to the validated session state if your PIN has been checked. So you've entered your PIN. It's been checked and it's correct. So we've got some transitions here that uh, that the programmer can talk about. So inserting the card, I'm in control of whether that happens. But whether the session is validated, well, the environment is in control of that. So using linearity, we can turn that into uh, an API that we can program against. Now, I'm not going to give all of the details. All of the details of this are in the paper. Um, but this this L type is um, it's like a monad transformer that that says uh, that turns an existing monad into something that uh, captures the linearity of the operation. So this this use equal one uh, basically means that the thing we're returning is going to be used one uh, used once exactly once. So we can initialize an ATM that gives us an ATM in the ready state that we can only consume once. Uh, if we insert the card, then We've got an ATM in the ready state that we use once, and that's going to return us a new ATM in the card inserted state that, again, we can use once. So this use once is, is um, capturing the property that we're working through the protocol. The interesting case is when we check the pin, because we, we have to start in the card inserted state, but the state we end up in is determined by something that happens at runtime. So this result type, this is a dependent pair type that returns a pair of the checked, whether, whether the pin was checked successfully or not, and then we calculate the type of the resource. Um, so if, it was, if the pin was correct, we end up in the session state. If it was incorrect, we end up in the card inserted state. So working through uh, a protocol. So um, And we, we can use type-driven interactive editing here. Uh, working through the protocol. I start with a, an ATM in the ready state. I have one of it. So if I, if I try um, inserting the card into this machine, and then check the type again. We'll see that we've spent M, but now we have one of M prime. So, so we've moved through the protocol. I'm just going to give it the same name because it's uh, uh, it's neater. The next thing we're going to do is check whether the um, pin was entered correctly. I'm just going to put some hard-coded pin in here. Um, it's always good to just work through this interactively. So um, I, I just just to see what we have. So so we've now sp we've spent M and we've got this new dependent pair. Um, so the, the result of checking the pin. Um, and uh, always easier to ask the machine to do these uh, these incremental steps. Uh, I'm going to do a case split on OK. So rather than look up the definition of res, I'm just going to do a case split on it. It says, right, I've got a value and a resource. And look at the hole again, see what we've got. We've got a resource, which is an ATM in some as yet unresolved state. But there's a clue in the type here. This unresolved state says, well, if I check it and it's correct, then I've got, I've got a, a running session. If I check it and it's incorrect, well, I'm still in the card inserted state. So I'll just do a bit of, um, a bit of variable renaming. And I'll ask for a case split on val. And OK, if I'm, if I'm in the correct state, then um, uh, then the ATM is probably validated and OK has been spent. And if I'm in the incorrect state, then the ATM is just in the card inserted state and uh, again, OK is spent. More interesting example of a protocol is uh, session types. So uh, session types allow us to describe communication patterns in general. So we can track the state of a channel and it turns out 
um, certainly bidirectional session types are imp implementable using um, quantitative type theory. So the basic idea, I'm just going to run through this very quickly, that uh, um, an action on a channel is that we're either sending a value and then there are more actions and those actions can be computed from the value we've just sent. So we've, we've actually got dependent session types basically for free here. Uh, and so we can receive something on the channel and again, the rest of the actions can depend on the value that uh, has been received. So we'll, we'll just use the fact that we've got first class types means we have we have the whole language available at the type level. Um, so we'll just use it. Um, we can describe protocols. So um, a protocol is like a global type. So we'll, use, we'll describe a protocol and then we'll calculate the channel types by um, from the protocol description. So a client uh, makes a request to a server or a server um, sends a response to a client uh, or we can sequence protocols and then we can calculate the client and server types from the global protocol description. So a utility protocol, uh, the client makes a request um, then if that request is to add two numbers, then we'll make a further request of the two numbers and then a response from the server. Or if the request is to reverse a string, then we'll send a request with the string and the server will respond back with the string. And when we can complete, compute the client and server types separately from that, um, we could also do you know, dependent session types where we could send a number on a channel. So we're, here we're sending a, a natural number on a channel and then we're getting that number of strings back from the server. So dependent session types, they just work because we have, we have the whole dependently typed language available at the type level, so we don't have to do anything special. So to send, the channel has to be in the ready to send state. We'll send a value of the right type. And then the state we end up in is the next state of that channel computed from the value that we sent. Um, receive, well, it's the other way around, but it's a dependent pair type, so we receive a value and then compute the type of the rest of the channel and then close. Uh, this is the thing that finally discards the channel. So, um, so if we've got a channel in the closed state, then we can discard it um, and we're done. And then finally, we've got fork, which um, says, well, you've got a protocol. I'll calculate the server type of that protocol, the client type of that protocol, and then we'll run those two in separate threads. So yeah, again, I'll just uh, just quickly show you um, how that works. Um, so with our uh, implementation of this utility server, so this is a this is the server end of um, of that uh, protocol. So um, I'm just running a receive on the channel to see what I've got, and then depending on whether it was add or reverse, I do different things. So. Um, so that currently type checks, but it's it's perhaps enlightening um, to show what happens just with with some holes. So uh, we see that the first thing I have to do when if I've received the add command is receive a pair of integers. So well, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, once I've received a pair of integers, the next thing I have to do is send an integer back. So that's what I'm going to do. And then once I've sent it, I've got a channel in the closed state. So it's it's what the value is one, so it has to be used once. The only way to use a channel in the closed state is to run the close function, and that discards it. Okay, so the summary is that uh, QTT uh, allows us to put um, more information in hold. It gives us um, nice interactive editing. It gives us uh, this this we've seen this example of interactive programming, looking at the context to see what we have available. So I like to think of programming as being a conversation with the type checker where it's it, it's a two it's a two-way uh, communication uh, with linearity we can implement protocols directly and interactively so uh, we've seen this atm protocol with the, the fact that this type checks is, is a guarantee that the protocol has been followed as i've specified it in the type and then we can scale this up to session types uh, for safe concurrent programming. So there's so much more we can do with this. I mean, this is this is the first implementation of, uh, of, of Idris 2. So to my knowledge, the first language with first class types that is uh, self-hosted and uh, uh, certainly the first um, practical implementation of quantitative type theory. I think there's so much fun we can have with this. So um, there's a lot of limitations that session types is implemented. So they're only bi-directional. They're only working for concurrency. So we need to think about you know, network programming, distributed programming, how do we handle errors, um, and so on. So I think there's lots of fun to be had. I very much encourage you to join in the fun. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for your attention.